Now, as you know, in part A of this podcast series, I endeavored to analyze what would be the reason that Lady Shawnee would not find herself in the same position as Pastor Keon's first two wives, i.e. finding herself in the position of being on the receiving end of one of his famous divorce petitions. And as I stated in part A, I think this question is answered by determining whether Pastor Keon ever had the chance to realize the moment that he desires more than anything in this lifetime, more than any relationship he could ever have with any woman. In other words, will his father, Dr. Cato Brooks Jr., pastor of Tree of Life Missionary Baptist Church in Gary, Indiana, ever publicly acknowledge Pastor Keon as his biological son? And up until now, if you think this story could not be any more gut-wrenching, then you better think again. What was it like? Because you didn't leave that church. Your mother didn't leave that church. No. Um, your sister didn't leave that church. No, sir. And, and we haven't even talked about that she was also his child. Um, how could you sit there? <laughs> Hi there. I'm Professor Blackmore, and I want to welcome you back to my channel and to my podcast series entitled Shani Girl, I hope you have a prenup. Now remember, as I stated in part A, in addition to showing you why I think some of the devastating events that took place early in Pastor Keon's life will dictate whether his relationship with Lady Shani will be able to overcome those obstacles. I also want to analyze the question of whether Pastor Keon will ever be satisfied with any woman. And so, let's jump right back in. I, I admired him as a pastor. I don't know what it is about the way my mind works, um, but I admired him as a pastor so much. And the hope that one day we could reconcile, I learned to just wait. Um, I hoped that every time he would sweat and I would wipe it off of the back of his head or if I got him the Gatorade that he used to drink afterwards or the Ricola that he would put in his mouth uh, because he had a very raspy voice or whether it would be to put his cape on because he used to wear robes. Right. And uh, I would put the cape over his shoulder and I would tuck a towel inside of the robe and put the cape on and, and lasso the chain. I just hoped that one day I would serve him until he accepted me. And um, he started to do little things. Um, I started preaching at 14. He let me preach my first sermon 10 minutes before he preached that Sunday, mm. which is something I saw him do with my brothers. And then he would say this to me, which I really didn't know how to take. Whenever it would, uh, he would say something about how proud he was of his sons. He would come to me after church and whisper in my ear and say, you know, I was talking about you. Wow. And uh, so I learned to survive on those broken pieces. That's funny because that's the kind of thing that a man says to a girlfriend, you know, you know, uh, chick on the side, you know, you know, I was thinking about you. So, so he's feeding you this line and you're getting the scraps that fall from the table well it's very interesting how he seems to still romanticize the relationship with his father uh how did that crushing that denial that rejection push you forward well first of all let me just say my mother was incredible in balancing what should have happened to me and what did she was instrumental in keeping my mind focused. She would look at me, she'd say, son, remember people don't have to be nice. And when they decide to be nice, they don't have to be nice to you. She would affirm me, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. He'll be sorry one day, you just see. She would just, I, and I, I would feed off of those things. And I think she cried enough for the both of us. <laughs> now. It is remarkable that he does not seem to blame his mother at all for the public situation that he 
and his sister were in at that church and in the community because clearly everybody knew what was going on. But he even says in the interview that if he had to do it all again, he would be reborn under the same circumstances just to get a chance to meet Bishop Jakes. So that just underscores the mindset here. But make no mistake about it, even though he has met Bishop Jakes, this is still a tortured soul of a man. He seems to always be seeking something. And I don't think meeting Lady Shawnee will quench his thirst. To answer the question, how? A defining moment for me was the day that I stopped expecting that it would be. My oldest brother dies. Um, he dies at 89 pounds. This is his son? His son. Okay. So this is your older brother, brother. secretly? Yeah. Who knows that I'm his brother, who lets me spend a night at the house as a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old, treats me. So what God had done is he had given me some tentacles into my family, even though I didn't get to go all the way in there, I had some connections. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've got my brother who knows that I'm his brother and he, whether actually or just facade, would be upset with me mm -hmm. at his house about my father not taking care of me, but he would do it. So I drove my brother's car to the prom. Okay. okay. Oh wow. So I've got I've got these tentacles that I'm connected to. And and by the way, his name is Cato Brooks, like my father. So my father's a junior, he's a third. Looks just like him. Um he dies. I don't know if it hurt me more than it hurt anybody else because my only connection to this larger than life personality is him. And my brother's gone. And we come to the funeral. Now I want to go back to the beginning of that clip when he answers the prior question, which was, how did this denial and rejection push him forward? When he now says that a defining moment for him was when he stopped expecting that it would be. In other words, that he would be recognized and publicly acknowledged by his father. And at this point in time in his life, I honestly don't think he had actually stopped expecting it. And you'll now see that he, in fact, had not stopped hoping for it. And the family is on one side. And the community is on the other. And I'm sitting on the side with the community. And that day I said, enough is enough. I, I either have to separate from the expectation that this will come, or I'm going to have a disdain in my heart so deep that I don't know if it'll ever be able to come out. Now remember, he has already said that he is already reconciled, that it would never be. And he is yet again hoping that he will be invited to sit with his father's family. And if you really think enough is really enough at this point, well, you won't believe what he said he did to yet again seek acknowledgement from his father. But at that funeral, enough was enough and I quit hoping for it so much so that he and I got into a fight. Uh, he tried to tell me, so I got married when I was 21. Mm -hmm. When I think about why I did that, it was one statement she said to me that stuck out. She says, I'm going to fill the hole that your father never did. And I must have fell in love with that statement. Wow. And I married a woman 10 years older than me. Wow. Um, at the age of 21 and searching for that, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I invited him to the wedding and he went off on me on the phone. You don't have any business married a woman that's da 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 And I think I would have walked away from ever marrying that woman if he would not have been against it. Uh. I, I, I know now that I went in full force because Def he was against it. Defiance. Defiance. Yeah. And he went off on me on the phone and he told me that he would get in the car and that he would come to Houston and he would take his belt off and that he would whoop me like I was a child. And I said, bring it on because you're going to get here and you're going to find out I ain't little and I'm going to hurt you. Mm -hmm. And he never came. All I was trying to get him to do was come. I said everything wrong that a son is not supposed to say to a father. 
to get him mad enough to come. And all I was rehearsing, if he actually would have came and said, you can do whatever you want to do to me, you can't. He could have beat me into the ground, but he came and he never came. And um, just like he had never come before. Wow. So you went through with the wedding? Went through the wedding, filed for divorce six months later. <laughs> so he was right. He was right. <laughs> Oh, he was so right. Wow. <laughs> He's actually saying that he would go to the extreme extent of marrying a woman. He had no business marrying his first wife just to get his father's attention and just to get his father to publicly acknowledge that he was his son by attending his wedding. You're in the car with me. Let's fast forward. Now you're going to make me cry because I... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Go ahead. We're going to do that. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I kind of became the surrogate father. Um, and you're in the Can car. Can I tell you, do yeah. you know what car we were in? No, too. Jeep Cherokee. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I was just hoping you would make a U-turn. <laughs> I, I was like, don't make a U-turn. The last time I was in one of these, it didn't work out right. It didn't go too good. <laughs> I'm in the car with you, and, and, and I'm pulling up the ramp near where my house was. And, and I decided to confront the way you processed what happened between you and your father as being your fault. Yeah. And I'm trying to make you understand that it was his problem. It was not your fault. And, and I'm playing it back to you from his perspective his fear, his failure, his gross negligence, <clears throat> his insecurity, his, his trap between his wife, his church, his image, and, and his weaknesses. What was that like for you when I was telling you? The thing that came over my mind at that moment was if I had to go back into my mother's womb and be reborn and have the same set of circumstances to get to this moment, I swear I would do it again. You approached me with a tender care that I had never felt from a man in my life. I, been loved by my mother, mm -hmm. but I didn't know what that was. Here I am in the car with the greatest preacher that has ever lived, <laughs> who has enough time for the guy that the other guy wouldn't come up the street for. Why me? You got three sons, two daughters, two million members. <laughs> 17,000 <laughs> 17, spiritual children, 16 conferences, 82 businesses. And here I am listening to you tell me how I needed to process. So he wants to be acknowledged by his father so badly that he thinks that being acknowledged by Bishop T.D. Jakes will quench that thirst. So much so that he says he would do it all again and be reborn under the same circumstances? Now, if you believe this, then I have some land to sell you. And that is because this is an unquenchable thirst that Pastor Keon has. And having a relationship with Bishop T.D. Jakes even can't quench it. And I'm quite sure Bishop even realizes this to be the truth. And it's a thirst that having a relationship with Shawnee can't even quench as much as she will try because this is an unquenchable thirst. And I prayed for that you would have a reckoning day with your father and you did. I did. Uh, you get the call that he's fading away and you travel to see him. You go in the house with his wife you go in the room where he is fading fast. This is the last chance to reconcile. You can't 
can't drive away this time. Uh... What did you say to him? Uh, he was eating. Um, my first words to him was, do you need any help? And for the first time, he said yes. So I got a napkin and I put it in the shirt and uh, he ate and I still can see it because he couldn't stand up. So he had the kind of chair where you push a button and the chair lifts you up to a standing position. Mm -hmm. He got exhausted eating. So in his underwear, I walk him to his bedroom, which is up two steps and to the right and the left. Walk him around his bed. I lay him in the bed, pull the covers over him. And for the first time, I'm in the bed with my father at the same time. And I laid in his bed and he began to talk to me. And he told me that I was his prized possession and that he was too weak of a man to tell the truth. And I asked him if it was okay if I recorded this on my phone because I knew this would be one of the last times I heard his voice and he said yes and I have this 45 minute conversation broken up into four segments of 10 on my cell phone right now. And he said, I wish I was a strong enough man to come and rescue you from the pain. And he said, I just didn't have it. Um, I would have lost the church and my wife and I didn't know how to choose you over all of that. And I understand that now. Which is exactly what I told you was what Which was is what you happen. told me behind it the whole time. Mm -hmm. You called it a trap that he was in. And he explained the trap to me piece by piece. Now, I want to go back to the thesis that I posed in part A of this podcast episode series, which is whether Pastor Keon will ever have a chance to realize the moment that he desires more than anything which is having his father, Dr. Cato Brooks Jr., to publicly acknowledge that he is his biological son. Now, Pastor recorded this conversation with his father because it was as close as he could come to realize this moment, but this is not a public acknowledgement, which is what this man, Pastor Keon, desires more than anything. And that is not what he has on this recording. How are you feeling at that moment? Happy. Really? I'm happy. Because? Because he was tired. And he wanted to live. I know he wanted to live. But I know he was okay if that was it. He was 77 years old. He was older when I was born. So I'm happy at the time he's telling me that. Then he falls asleep while he's talking to me. And happiness turns into fear because I cannot escape my imagination at that moment that I'm looking at him sleep. And I said to myself, it won't be long before I see that face again in that position. I just knew that that was it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew I would never see him alive again. You loved him. With everything in me. I, I never loved somebody I hated so much. <laughs> <laughs> I loved him till he took his last breath. Now, it's interesting that he can't explain or verbalize why he was really happy to hear what his father had just told him. And I think What's also so interesting is how he remembers everything about his father, every reaction he had with his father with such great detail. But is he still hoping that his father will publicly acknowledge that he is his son? And you went to that funeral and I was worried about you because once again, you were not with the family. 
Did you get closer? I don't know. Do you have it now? I do now. What gave it? Um, I came to your house a few weeks after the funeral was over. And my wife, you remember she fell asleep on your uh, yeah, on your chair? Yeah. And you and I talked for hours. And I cried again. And but that day you didn't you didn't meet me with that emotion that you had in previous times. Mm -hmm. It was like it was one of those moments. It was like, all right, son, shake it off. Mm -hmm. let's move forward, let's process the pain, and let's tell the story. I left your house and I went to preach in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And I remember calling you at their afternoon, which was your morning, <laughs> and you still answer the phone. I got a release preaching that day. I told the story for the first time, and I let it out. And the whole church was at the altar, and I was leaning up against Pastor Bill Dooms uh, at Coles. I was leaning up against his LED screen, crying. <laughs> and he's standing on the front row looking at me, and I was like, ah, this is it. I'm released, God. I, I, I'm, I knew that I had closure when I could tell the story mm -hmm. and not feel bad about it. Mm -hmm. Now, the wife that he's talking about here is Lady Felicia, not Lady Shawnee. So... I know Lady Felicia knows this man is troubled beyond human understanding. But the question is, does Shani know? And does she know that this is not anything that she can fix? I remember Lady Felicia say that we think love is enough. And to be honest, love isn't enough. And people need to understand that it is not enough. And I think Pastor Keon has enough sense to know that. But... The question is, why does he keep dragging these poor women into this dysfunction? But Lady Shani, I'm going to take this back to the beginning thesis question and answer for the reason that you will very likely end up being ex first lady number two and ex wife number three. How does it feel riding in the car? anticipating a conversation that is so important to you and totally uncertain of what the answer might be. What, what, what were you feeling? I was nervous, uh, very tactful to ensure that I would present myself as a son that you could be proud of. Mm -hmm. um, making sure that I made no mistakes so that way when this conversation is over, you would grab me and you would take me back to that church and that you would tell everybody, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Right. I anticipated. You had a vision of how it was going to go. I did. It didn't go that way. Uh, he died in January of last year and it still never happened. He never acknowledged you. No. And so, Lady Shani, it never came to pass. Pastor Keon never realized the moment he desired the most. His father's public acknowledgement. And what's even worse he never got a chance to realize it after his death because he yet again was not invited to sit with the family at his father's funeral. And so, in my opinion, Lady Shani, this is not something that you can fix, baby girl. But what do you think? Do you believe Pastor Keon's inability to ever realize public acknowledgement from his father that he was his biological son is a painful thirst that cannot be satisfied by any relationship with any woman, including Shawnee. Please let me know what you think by leaving your comments in the comments section below. And I hope you'll also give me a big thumbs up. And I hope you'll also consider donating to this video and my entire channel ministry by donating to the Professor Blackmore Cash App. And I hope you'll also subscribe to my YouTube channel and click the bell so you'll be notified whenever I come back with more hot tea on this reality show.
Church House, Hot Mess Drama. And please also follow me on TikTok and Instagram.